So hello, thank you for joining us. This is Rick Harnish. I'm the executive director of the High Speed Rail Alliance. Um, we are a nonprofit educational organization for those who aren't familiar with us. Um, we're a growing network of individuals, civic leaders and elected officials who uh, want to bring the game changing power of fast, frequent and dependable trains to the US. Um, we're education focused. We strive to be through research, the uh, most knowledgeable independent source of what high-speed rail is, um, why we need to build it here and what steps folks can take to make it happen. Um, and then we provide you and um, others the tools they need to educate their leaders, uh, both in state capitals and in, um, in the federal capital as we strive for um, a big program. And we believe in high-speed rail as part of an integrated network where uh, trains become you know, viewed as something that could be put together in different ways depending upon your local assets and your local needs. But to simplify it, we categorize infrastructure as high-speed lines, 160 miles an hour and above, regional lines where you're building, rebuilding existing assets to be focused on passenger and short, fast freight trains, and shared use lines where the uh, passenger trains are going frequently at speeds of less than 90 miles per hour um, with um, heavy haul freight trains. And you can mix these together in many different ways. The key is we need to create a lot of connectivity throughout the country, not only for people riding the trains, but in order to create that connectivity amongst advocates so that we can create a stronger coalition. Um, our goal is a big federal program to invest in railroad infrastructure um, that is at least 49 states uh, in that program. And I'd be willing to throw something in, in for Hawaii uh, as they do have an interstate highway in Hawaii, make it 50 states. Um, we need to be very optimistic. We need to plan for success, but we need to both have the big picture stuff that may take a while to get there, but also some really quick near-term wins that can happen in the first two years of the Biden administration. And we really view that we need to stop this struggle between the owning railroads um, and the passenger railroads and come up with something that makes this a very strong business case for the class one railroads, just like defense contractors make a lot of money building weapons. Um, so that's our big picture agenda. Um, in the Chicago area, Chicago is the center of this network and uh, it has a high impact. And uh, it's also important in terms of the innovation of bringing various agencies together to create a coordinated plan to build different pieces by different agencies, but in a coordinated way so that it impacts everybody at a much higher level. So I've got today uh, Mark Maglieri uh, with Amtrak and Jeff Schreiber um, with the Chicago Department of Transportation to give a presentation on what CREATE is, the progress that we've made, and the steps moving forward. Uh, so go ahead and take it away, guys. You know, Rick, Thanks. there are interstate highway signs in Puerto Rico, too. OK. So I, I was wondering about um, you know the Virgin Islands, et cetera. Mm -hmm. but <laughs> the, the point is, this isn't just about city pairs. This is about an interconnected network for the whole country. Yeah. Thanks. Well, thanks everyone for joining us today um, to hear about uh, CREATE, uh, which uh, might classify as a high-speed rail adjacent initiative. Obviously, high-speed rail, you know, is 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 part of the uh, the CREATE uh, set of, of priorities. What we're trying to achieve, and so uh, hopefully after today's presentation, uh, everyone will be a little more knowledgeable about um, CREATE in general if you're not already, and then uh, and can maybe talk about the questions and answers uh, related to CREATE's relation to high-speed rail. 
So my name is Jeff Schreiber. I uh, am the Director of Transportation Planning and Programming at the City of Chicago's Department of Transportation and oversee the city's involvement in CREATE. And uh, Mark, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. I'm Mark Maglieri. I'm the Chicago-based Amtrak spokesman responsible for representing the company in only about half the country, um, including states where we don't yet have service, such as South Dakota and Wyoming. Although earlier this week, we talked about uh, service from Cheyenne to Denver to Pueblo and perhaps even further south. We did have the governor of South Dakota comment when we uh, first saw the president's infrastructure plan. She said, what about us? So maybe like Rick Harnish having trains in Hawaii or Puerto Rico, maybe someday we'll have Amtrak trains in South Dakota too. Terrific. And they'll, uh, and they'll be starting here in Chicago, hopefully. Sure. So, um, uh -oh, is this working? All right. Hope everyone can see the second slide now. Um, so um, just to just to get things started, I think uh, probably this won't be news to to most, if not all, the people on uh, attending today's uh, uh, call. Um, that you know, Chicago is the hub of the North American uh, freight rail system. It's also the, the hub of uh, um, Amtrak's uh, long distance train network too, um, using a, a, a lot of the same tracks uh, for better or worse as the case may be some, sometimes. But uh, um, so just, just to set some context though, um, the, about half of all of the intermodal um, freight in, in the nation that's handled on rail uh, will end up coming through or, or, or be destined to or from Chicago um, over the course of its journey. So there's there's really no place else in the United States that has that that sort of volume. In fact, um, if you if you totaled up all the containerized freight activity happening in the Chicago region, it would be just over that happening at LA and Long Beach Port, and it'd be in fact rank among the, about the top 15. Um, seaports in the entire world, um, top in the United States and, and in the top 15 in the whole world in terms of containerized activity. And obviously we're not anywhere near an ocean. Um, so that, but the level of activity is, is, is as significant as you might think it is when you look around at all of the intermodal yards around the region. Um, and then just in terms of general uh, freight, uh, more than a quarter of the general rail freight uh, traveling around in the country, the car uh, traffic um, ends up coming through Chicago. And uh, that you know total is uh, uh, six hundred more than six hundred billion dollars worth of uh, of, of, of commerce um, that that gets handled on the on the freight rail system here. So so what what is create in general? It's a it's a public private partnership, but not in the in the sense that it's often used in that that's with a private risk and financing. It's more of a public private partnership in terms of that the benefits are distributed across both public and private entities and, and we're all in this together as a partnership. So the um, starting from the US DOT at the federal level to the uh, IDOT at the state level, uh, CDOT at the city level and Cook County at the county level we're all are all partners in this as well as the uh, six um, uh, uh, freight railroads that serve Chicago, two switching railroads, and two uh, major passenger carriers, obviously Amtrak, and but also uh, Metro. So all, all partners in, in the CREATE program. And the idea here is to um, solve the problems that jointly affect all of us. What had happened before CREATE, CREATE's nearly 20 years old now. And, and what was happening before that is that um, there were, because there's so much shared infrastructure in the Chicago region on the rail side, uh, things that were kind of everybody's problem became nobody's problem. And it really took a, a joint effort. Nobody, no individual railroad or public entity was going to solve these problems because they involved, you know, use and, and participation among many uh, entities. So we really needed this partnership so that we could collectively determine how these shared problems were going to get solved, how the capacity and the infrastructure was going to get improved, and, and then uh, figure out how it's all going to get paid for too. So that the CREATE program there is, uh, um, se will separate freight and commuter trains and Amtrak trains at six key junctions and also eliminate 25 road rail grade crossings as well as um, the remaining 70 uh, projects um, uh, mostly affect uh, the rail side of operations and uh, adding tracks, improving signals, switches, adding capacity on, on the rail side of it. And if you would have invited Jeff and me to do this, uh, even five years ago, that list of participants would be shorter. 
for those folks, including myself, who live in Cook County, Cook County has really engaged in the last few years to be part of the process and, and involved in our advocacy. And it's really kudos to the folks at the county who say, this is not just a city project, it's countywide. In fact, it's region-wide. So here is the Create Map. You might have seen this, uh, and I hope you have visited our, our newly redone createprogram.org website to see this and all the great resources we've been putting up in the last only few weeks. But it took a while in my create involvement to understand the, the color codes and the letters, the P's, the EW's, the B's, the WA's. The P are passenger oriented projects. And you saw at the very beginning of this slide and in fact, Rick's introduction slide, P1, the first big passenger project has been completed. And that's commonly known as the Inglewood flyover where the Metro Rock Island district trains used to cross at a diamond with the NS line coming in from Indiana that we also use for Amtrak trains, all of our state sponsored trains to Michigan and the trains to the East Coast all would have to fight over space at that diamond. And it was a great day for CREATE. It was a great day for passenger rail. And it enables, in fact, um, I'll make mention of this in a second, our current operations to get through there without having to wait for each other. Metro trains fly up above, we pass by at ground level. And when that was designed, and then the agreement for it is more space than what we're using now, uh, space was left for an additional passenger only uh, line to go through that same part of the woods. In fact, if you drive down the Skyway every day or every so often and pay the, what is it now, $8 to use the Skyway uh, and look off to the left, you'll see where historically the New York Central and the Pennsylvania Railroad used to race their way into Chicago. So there's lots and lots of, of railroad infrastructure that's unused. It's being used, uh, that part of it's being used by Commonwealth Edison for a power line corridor. But when P1 was done, it was done in a way to allow us to create at some point a passenger only corridor through there. So uh, the folks on the Create Management Committee and, and certainly Jeff and the city has a leadership role in this. And the city has stepped up historically to be part of this city and IDOT and the Association of American Railroads and those of us in the Railroad specifically, all work together to make these happen. So if you look at P1, which is, uh, I don't know if you can, uh, if, if you have a way of mousing over to that, Rick or, or Jeff to show, but there it is. P1 right there is the Inglewood flyover. P2 and P3 are all part of the 75th Street corridor. And the 75th Street corridor is a horrible location where four railroad, four railroad tracks go down to two. And that two is on a, uh, overpass. And at 75th Street, those trains are passing through there a lot. And 75th is an important east-west arterial street in Chicago. So P2, P3, EW1, all there in the big circle is the 75th Street corridor. That's our right now biggest uh, passenger-oriented project. Now, Amtrak trains don't go east and west there. We pass over there. We're we're uh, over to the right of there towards P2, but Metra trains do. Metra and CSX and other railroads are all trying to get through another set of diamonds because the railroads pass each other at grade. So thanks, Jeff, brought up the passenger corridor, corridor uh, arrows. You can see where the passenger trains, at least our trains and Metra's trains go. And there's a lot of activity at 75th Street and we're on our way to getting that fixed. After P2 and P3 are other P projects around the area, including uh, Grand Crossing, should that come to pass, although there's some alternatives being explored to that. So although the, some, only some of these icons are Ps, others are EWs and Bs and, and WAs, the fact is a problem anywhere in the network, a problem up by Bensonville, is going to cause a problem for our trains and Metro's trains trying to get in and out of Chicago. So CREATE needs to be looked at holistically, not just the passenger centric projects, but all the projects that enable freight trains to do their business, to exchange cars, to be operating to and through Chicago helps passenger trains. When Mike Frankie was one of my colleagues here at Amtrak, 
he made it clear to me and others that a problem somewhere on the network is a problem everywhere in the network, which is why you might recall a few years ago, we did the Chicago Gateway Project that, that uh, Mr. Boardman and, and others had, and that information still lives on Amtrak.com slash Chicago Gateway. And there's data there about some of these uh, instances, and there's even animation about Englewood and 75th Street. A problem anywhere in this network is a problem everywhere in this network. And finally, 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 we're making some progress to untangle some of this. So here's what we've done so far. And Jeff, this, I guess, is my slide too. Yes, we've, and you know, some of these are projects that nobody really notices unless you live in the neighborhood or go down some of these streets, but there's already 31 complete projects in the CREATE program in our more than 10 years of activity. There are projects under construction and that includes that 75th Street corridor. There are eight projects in design. Before you can build them, you have to design them. And in this country, for all the right reasons, projects need environmental review. We need to respect the neighborhoods we're in and we had to take care that we're not making a bad situation worse. That's what environmental review gets us. Are we doing the right thing in the right way? So there are 19 remaining projects. So you could say, well, gee whiz, creates half done, right? More than half done, 31 done, 19 to go and the other uh, 12 in, in some form. Well, there's a lot to do, right, Jeff? Oh, yeah. So, um, but I think this chart, one other thing on this chart, it just, just shows that there has been continuous progress. I know sometimes um, erroneously the, the media might like to say, uh, Oh, it's create stalled out. Well, no, there's there's a lot of work going on. And we also like to keep projects in various stages of implementation too, so that, you know, we basically the funding for create has been mostly opportunistic on the public side. When there is a state capital bill, when there's a federal transportation bill, when there are these, these opportunities, um, then we have projects at a state of readiness to, to go and, and get them done. And knowing because we have done the planning at a programmatic level, that the pieces will all fit together. And we know if projects are dependent upon one another and know that certain things have to happen in certain order. And in some cases, the order doesn't matter. So we know that we're not, you know, we're not, uh, we know where the dependencies are too because of that planning. So I'd also like to take just a, a minute here to point out something that might be also of interest to the, the people um, on the call today. And that is um, uh, grade, uh, grade crossings, which are not, just affect the um, you know uh, freight trains, but also passenger service and 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 simply uh, all the uh, motorized and pedestrian and, and bicycle traffic in in the area too. Obviously, with so many uh, tracks in the Chicago region, um, there are a lot of grade crossings. A lot of the grade crossings in the city were historically separated. Although as you get to the outer parts of the city, um, the the grade separation didn't get that far. And as you get into the suburbs, there's still a lot of grade separation needs. So the uh, public agencies involved with CREATE had recently um, uh, conducted what we call the Northeastern Illinois Pri Priority Grade Crossing uh, Review. And that uh, came up with um, a list of 47 priority crossings. Um, 16 of those are actually also within the CREATE program. There's 25 total crossings within CREATE. So we didn't count ones that were already done. 16 is basically all the ones that remain. Um, and, and then a bunch of others. And some of these include, uh, some of those 47 include groups of multiple crossings that are in close proximity that would basically, you're gonna separate one, you're separating all of them. So, uh, so that's something that you can, you can find more information about this on the CMAP website. CMAP has kind of taken the, the umbrella lead, but involved the input from IDOT, CDOT, um, Cook County, as well as the Illinois Commerce Commission. So again, another, that's not create directly, but it's it's very create adjacent, and it also is adjacent to uh, improving passenger rail in in the region, and just a probably of interest to to some of the people on the call today. And it's a hot button for the general public. If you tell the general public, hey, this create thing's going on, and freight trains are going to move through, and passenger trains are going to whip across, what affects the general public more than almost anything else, because not everybody rides Amtrak or Metro or or understands what's on a freight train, crossings are a hot button for the public. As, I, mean, I was just uh, in, in West Elsden where my other son lives. I'm doing this from one of my son's houses. 
And I lost track, because I didn't try to keep track, of all the grade crossings I had to go over to visit my son on my way out here to my other son's house. And thank goodness that there weren't freight trains doing switching or other important work on those crossings, or I never would have gotten here in time. So crossings are important. Crossing safety is even more important. And trying to reduce the road and rail conflicts are important, just as reducing rail to rail conflicts are. I don't get to say West Elsden very often, so I thought I would throw that in there. I don't even know there was a Chicago neighborhood until my son and daughter-in-law bought a house there. So let's go uh, look at some passenger rail projects. And that is, uh, that picture you just saw was 75th Street, right? So yep, what we yeah, call the 75th it. Street corridor, because there's more to it than just 75th Street itself. Take a look at all of this, right? We're going to untangle the belt junction. That's it over there at P2. We're going to create a flyover here at P3 and take care of making it easier for Metro trains to get through and CSX trains to get to and from their yards. We don't yet have all the funding to do P2. We have some funding that's working here on, uh, on the, the 75th Street corridor, but certainly as funding becomes available and the president you heard in the last few weeks wants to make funding available for rail, $80 billion worth of funding available for rail. We wanna get this job done and we wanna improve life in that neighborhood. Again, if you are on 75th Street, trying to pick up your child, trying to get to the hospital, trying to just get home. And there's lots of activity on that north-south CSX-owned right of, CSX right of way. This will solve some of that. Great separations, untangling the railroad, because if you look over there where P2 and P3 is, right now, those four tracks go down to two. I mean, it's really amazing. There's drone video in our Chicago Gateway part of Amtrak.com which shows you the, all these tracks going down to two, which is like you know being on the uh, a, a four-lane expressway and taking it down to a two-lane road. It has to cause backup, and it does. So this is our next big fix, and some of that big fixing is already underway. Just to to add to to Mark, so we've got um, design funding already for. Uh for all four of these uh, components of, of the uh, 75th Street corridor to receive that uh, from a, um, a combination of federal, state, uh, county, and, 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 and railroad sources and city sources in uh, 2018, we put that package together. Now design is fully underway and uh, construction will soon start on the P3 part and the GS19 part. That's the, will be the big CSX flyover here in the represented in, in blue, the north-south flyover. So that's part of untangling this knot. What remains though is to, to get the um, construction funding for P2 and EW2, that's in final design now. The construction estimates are, are getting improved for, for that right now. And uh, we hope within the next year or two to be able to seek uh, additional federal funding and then match with uh, more state, local and, uh, and railroad funding to do the big part of this. So the, the existing part that's underway right now comes to a little over $400 million. Finishing the remainder is probably gonna be in the seven to $800 million range. So altogether, this is a more than a billion dollar kind of mega project that's being, being done in two pieces, which we can make sense operationally and uh, physically. So here's the uh, timeline, sorry, go ahead, Mark. Oh, go ahead, Jeff. You're closer to the timeline than I am. So you see, what okay. we are here, right, in 2021. So you're going to start seeing more work being done that's of a permanent nature by the end of this year. There's some get ready to go work going on now. Well, we did the design and uh, for both the P2 side, EW2 side, those are basically the east side of the project. And we, uh, as money becomes available um, and as, as uh, initiative happens at both the state and federal level, we fully expect to complete this project, but like everything else, it's not gonna be soon and it's not going to be easy, but it is going to be possible and it should be possible by 2025, which is a mere four years from now. By the time these grandkids on their side of that, that wall will be done eating lunch and off to school. I think one thing we, we forgot to mention of vital importance to, especially to this audience um, is that by, by pulling one of the one of the uh, I, 
one of the values of pulling um, Metra um, out of and over what, what's represented as P2 on this drawing here. Right now, those Metra trains actually continue up, up north towards Union Station. This is the Metra Southwest service. But this P2 untangling will actually realign those Metra uh, Southwest service trains so that they go into LaSalle Street Station via the Rock Island line. Um, and that has a, a number of, of benefits for passenger rail. It frees up capacity at Union Station and um, it, it allocates, uh, it uses uh, currently a spare capacity at Rock Island Station and some of the track improvements that are needed on the Rock Island line to make this happen could also help out um, with adding uh, sufficient capacity on the Rock Island line to uh, potentially in the future allow some um, uh, Amtrak services or inner city services use the Rock Island line and then switch over to Union Station when it gets closer to downtown. So that's the FRA these are all has kind of precursors to doing better stuff for passengers. Sorry, Mark. Yeah, the FRA has various rules depending on who's in charge, but there is a record of decision that calls for the movement of our Chicago, St. Louis, Lincoln service and Texas Eagle trains off of the current CN owned right of way out to Joliet and over to a more passenger oriented Rock Island district. That's one of the reasons why Amtrak's invested in this project, because it will improve that going forward and will improve what we have in our service going out to Indiana in the meantime. So yeah, that's uh, you'll see more about uh, how this helps Union Station in a later slide. Oh, and there it is right now. So here's where things stand at Chicago Union Station. We and Metra and IDOT and CDOT and others, including the RTA have been working together and putting in grant applications for reconfiguring the concourse level of the station. If you were in there this week or last week, or even you know six weeks ago, you could say to yourself, well, gee, why do they need all this reconfiguration? Well, we fully expect to grow Amtrak service. We fully hope that Metro service will recover and we're going to need the space to be untangled down there. The 1991 renovations that basically separated Amtrak customers from Metra customers and reconfigured the lower level of the station has been outgrown. If you were in our station in 2019, if you're in our station in 2018 or 15 or 14 or 13 or 12, or even earlier than that, you can see how really tough it is to negotiate both for Metra customers who are commuters and know their way around the station, and especially for Amtrak customers who are occasional users, get there and there's this forest of signs a bunch of folks who are running to and from their Metra trains and Amtrak trains. We need to take action. What we have now at the concourse level, we need to take advantage of the time we have while service is recovering to get more of this done. And you can fully expect, again, in the president's plan, which is more meats being hung on those bones every few days, but what that's gonna mean for rail is that we and Metra and CDOT and IDOT and the RTA and others are gonna continue looking for funds to reconfigure the concourse level of the station. I wish I could tell you that any of the previous grants we uh, all sought uh, had been awarded, but they haven't. And in the meantime, we're continuing to, uh, to try. Now, just across the street from us, just across Jackson Boulevard, you might remember that the city has made a major investment in a CTA transfer station which uh, is fully functional and works very well. I use it myself. And behind that was a near end of life Amtrak parking garage, which uh, we owned the land beneath it and we sold it. And with the city's uh, encouragement and uh, direction are redirecting some of those proceeds back into helping Union Station. And I'll show you those in a second later in the slide. But right now the 320 South Canal Street building is under construction. They just had the top off ceremony in the last two weeks with the, the mayor and others. That's a 50 story office building with BMO Harris Bank as the anchor tenant. And part of what the city made sure happened when that building got built or as it's being built is the creation of actual green space. The only green space that's on uh, basically between Halstead Street and Franklin Boulevard uh, is going to be this 1.5 acre park. So those Amtrak customers who are wanting to get some fresh air, those Amtrak customers with pets, because we allow pets to travel up to certain sizes and for certain distances, there's no pet relief facility right now at Union Station. There will be when this park is open. And for those who have been concerned about Union Station 
parking issues since we lost the parking deck, there's a parking structure that's going to be built underneath that park. And the money that we received from the land sale at the city's direction is being used to improve Union Station. The food hall that uh, has been constructed in the former uh, Fred Harvey space, which had been out of use since the 80s, that's almost 40 years of unused space there, ever since a terrible fire on a Saturday morning when some of the folks who were working had to be helicoptered off the roof and one person who was stuck working on budget work on a Saturday actually lost his life in that fire. That room had been out of service. Well, for the money we received from this land sale has developed this food hall. And in fact, uh, the food hall itself has been roughed in. That was our plan. And Jeff's CDOT crews are at work even today, just in the last two weeks, reconfiguring Clinton Street. This will create a center block entrance to and from the station, basically straight through from the concourse level up into the Great Hall and out those doors to Clinton Street and the very popular growing West Loop. As when CDOT completes the street reconfiguration, which includes a center block crosswalk, we will then open those new entrances. At the same time, we're seeking a food hall operator. I was watching the video that was produced by Riverside Development, who's developing the, that 30, 320 South Canal building. And uh, they're showing scads of people using that office building. But those scads of people will need somewhere to eat. So between our food court in the mezzanine level and hopefully this active food hall, uh, we'll have a place for them to eat. And as that building is finished, it'll increase the likelihood that there'll be more development. But I wanted you to see their uh, rendering of that park and let you know that we will in fully intend to open the new entrance to Clinton Street in the next few months. And uh, Jeff, your folks are doing good work out there. Thank you. One, one other note about this, this redevelopment of this office tower in this park is it will create a very pleasant uh, walk between uh, Union Station and the CTA Blue Line Station at uh, uh, Clinton and Congress. And, if, and when, when weather is, is uh, pleasant, that walk can occur right through this park, going through the, the Union Station Transit Center, the, the CTA bus uh, station that, that Mark mentioned, and through this park and onwards to the court. This park will extend all the way to the corner of Van Buren and Clinton. And then from there, it's, uh, it's, it's within sight distance, a short block further to the CTA station. Uh, during inclement weather, there will actually be an indoor passageway um, through the, the parking uh, garage and then into the, uh, the basement level of, of the building and then connecting to that same passageway that used to connect to the parking garage and even longer ago connected to what had been a CTA station that was on this very site. Um, so, uh, so there will be both uh, indoor and outdoor passageways to, uh, to get most of the way between uh, CTA and Union Station with that last block. Uh, hopefully coming at some point in the future, although there's not, not specific plans for that right at the moment, but we're trying to bridge the gap and piece by piece. You might remember the pedway that, that we have sort of dead end and into the basement of the parking, of, our, of then that parking garage. And then with no real defined path, you were supposed to maybe find your way through that parking garage out to the sidewalk to make your way to the Blue Line Station. This will be a designated pathway through the the parking structure it's being built in this building to take people only about a half block away from the Blue Line Station. So the Blue Line Station at Clinton, I was once told is one of the deepest uh, CTA stations on their system. So trying to get from that last half block underneath those buildings that are at the far side of this uh, rendering will be a challenge, but eventually that CTA station, which is not ADA compliant and only has escalators halfway up, will have to be redone. And this was done in a way that will enable us to connect those last few dots. Likewise, CDOT has plans to improve Canal Street on the other side of this block between, uh, well, basically what, Jeff, all the way from- uh, From uh, from Ogilvy Station all the way down to Taylor Street south, way south. There. Which is actually a viaduct. And as people who take our trains know, uh, sometimes there are issues with that viaduct. So if you watch the news sometimes, there are sometimes issues with that viaduct. That's all going to be redone in the next uh, eight years, Jeff? Uh, hopefully a lot sooner than that. We should be starting the first pieces of it later this year. And then uh, um, 
hopefully once it's underway, it'll probably be about a three or four year project. It's got to be staged quite a bit. It's got like sort of like we call it a mini Wacker Drive reconstruction because it is a double decker and we got to be attentive to what's happening below and what's happening above. Um, but that'll be, yeah, that'll be terrific. That original structure dates from when Union Station first opened nearly 100 years ago. So it's uh, it's well overdue for being rebuilt. And, and as we're rebuilding it, we're gonna be reconfiguring the lanes. And as some of you may know, we, we reconfigured the lanes a bit to improve the bus lanes on, on Canal Street a few years ago and kind of some lessons learned from that and knowing that we're gonna be redoing this all right now, we're gonna tweak that a bit more to make it work even better and provide more pickup and drop off space right at Union Station, especially in that Jackson to Adams block. So you can see why it's important that we create that opening on Clinton Street because Clinton's gonna carry a lot of the burden that Canal Street's been carrying, especially in the middle of the construction project. Right, yeah. So just uh, quickly, I also wanted to, to mention another um, uh, CREATE uh, related initiative. You know, about 20 years ago, right, as CREATE was uh, getting started, the city did a study called uh, Freight Rail Futures for the City of Chicago. And it, uh, it basically um, set out like what, you know, what's the value of freight and, and rail in Chicago anymore to begin with? Should we just like get rid of all this, the trains or to what should we, you know, what should we do? And, and so that study did a, a number of scenarios, did some scenario based planning and basically came to the conclusion that actually, you know, freight is good for Chicago rail in general, passenger rail is all good for Chicago, but the, the, the railroads and the city and the public agencies need to be cooperating and need to, to, to work together to, to figure out where the problems are that need to be solved. And that, that study that was released back in 03 was, was really provided the sort of the um, analytical and uh, sort of intellectual foundation for what ended up becoming the CREATE program. Well, that's 20 years old now. The rail industry, especially on the freight side, has changed quite considerably since then. The nature of the flows and commodity flows and freight flows has changed. And so we've started a new initiative. We're calling it Chicago Rail Future Study 2. Um, that's going to be um, exploring, you know, what, what, what do we need in the next 10 to 20 years? And uh, um, what, what does the future of CREATE look like? What does the future of rail look like? And where do we need to position ourselves as both public sector en entities and private sector entities? And this will look at both freight and, and uh, passenger rail. We'll also look at the, um, look maybe more closely than we have in the past at the community impacts of, of railroads and the equity implications for kind of which communities bear, bear the brunt of the negative externalities. I think everybody agrees that overall, this is very important, positive for the region, but, the, uh, but there are some uh, disbenefits or externalities and, 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 and where are those concentrated and what can we do as we design these projects to, to, to pay attention to that too and, and not just say, well, overall, everything's good and a few people suffer and walk away. You know, that's, that's, not, that's not the right way to do planning. We need to really pay attention to, to, to everybody and, and make sure it's a win-win for all. So that's this study we've got underway. It's probably gonna take another 12 to 18 months. It's gonna have a lot of economic analysis and we wanna kind of see through the the COVID disruptions by the time this is done too. So so we've given ourselves some time to, to look at that, but this could set the stage for, for what's next. Um, I'm sorry, this slide also just talks about some of these activities with outreach, outreach research, scenario analysis, and then these equity and local impact analysis that I just mentioned. The more information on this study is also available at, if you Google the uh, Chicago Rail Futures uh, study. And then so been... uh, on to Amtrak updates. Well, thanks, Jeff. We couldn't do this without giving you a sort of a general update about how things are going at America's Railroad. The full Hiawatha service, that is the regular seven weekday round trips, Monday through Thursday, the additional Friday night, the uh, six and seven that happen on Saturdays and the six round trips that happen on Sundays, all return on May 24th. That's been loaded in the reservation system and you're welcome to buy tickets. We'll have a more formal news release about this, but we've certainly let the stakeholders know and in talking to WISDOT and Illinois DOT who fund the service with us, uh, we've, talked, we've talked to employers and we've talked to our customers and we see that there's been enough recovery and enough intention on the part of businesses to, to resume something more like normal office operations to resume full Hiawatha service. Again, that's May 24th. At the same time that week, We'll also be beginning the phased return of national network, also known as long distance trains, sometimes called LD trains. 
I think LD stands for legendary destinations, but others may have a different definition. In any case, those trains start uh, coming back that week. And by the end of the following week, all of our Chicago connected overnight services or national network or LD trains will be fully restored that week. That was the direction from Congress. That's the funding we've been seeking from Congress since last summer. As you know, back in October, we scaled back some of these trains to only three times a week in each direction. We're recalling employees, we're, we're recertifying employees, we're training employees. Of course, we're, as you would do routinely, we're drug testing employees. All those things are being done right now to bring service back at the end of next month. You see in that picture, some of the uh, Amtrak Midwest rail cars, they were out doing some testing with them this week. We will deploy new rail cars on the state-sponsored services under the Amtrak Midwest umbrella starting soon. I can't tell you the date of the soon, but we're all working very hard for that soon to be really soon. The cars are uh, very different than the cars you're riding in today. They have some of the amenities built in instead of added on. They are uh, modeled on a successful prototype that's being used elsewhere in the country. And you'll be seeing those cars out there with their big windows and uh, built-in Wi-Fi and ADA compliant lavatories and ADA compliant uh, display systems to tell customers uh, where, where they are and where the next stop is and more ability to carry bicycles built in, not added on. So that's all coming and expect that this summer. Also this summer, we should be seeing the speed increases on the routes in Illinois and Michigan. The, the Michigan-owned segment, basically from Kalamazoo to just past the Dearborn Station, will be uh, operating at a higher speed for a good chunk of that um, later this year. And certainly in downstate Illinois, we'll be uh, operating at 90 miles an hour on much of that south of Joliet, uh, almost all the way to Alton. So as those things happen, we won't be shy about telling you. In fact, we have an obligation on the safety front to make sure the communities know that it was already unsafe to hang out by the tracks. The trains are going still faster. Uh, it's even more unsafe to be hanging out by the tracks. So we'll be doing some of those community notifications because we wanna operate safely in Illinois. Uh, that state has decided to install four-sided gates and additional signage and fencing. We're also adding fencing in Michigan too. Uh, in the last two weeks, we unveiled the AmtrakConnectsUs.com website which has a 15 year strategy for more service in more places and more service more often in places where we are now. Certainly there's a lot of momentum behind the idea of, of additional funding for rail. We've been asked for years, you know, when are you going to stop playing defense and when are you gonna start playing offense? When is it clear that the idea of defending an Amtrak system is finally a, a fight that's been fought and won repeatedly? Let's talk about growing. Let's talk about not just uh, surviving, but thriving. Some of the things you'll see in that vision at AmtrakConnectsUs.com uh, have a lot of that. We had our first big media roundtable with the media from Wyoming and Colorado and the Front Range Commission, which is already a functioning group, working hard to uh, get service there. Just as we're working with the Southern Rail Commission for their service ideas between Mobile and New Orleans. So those are all things that are hot, hot, hot right now. We announced that map. I think within three days, I had 50 media interviews. I think it's 90 now. There's a lot of interest in adding service around the country and increasing service where we are. And as I said, the uh, governor of South Dakota said, what about us? Uh, I was in the Knoxville paper this week with people in Knoxville saying, what about us? There's lots of people who want service around this country. Some of it's lower hanging fruit than others. For example, in time, since we stopped running the National Limited in 1979, the actual tracks we used for Indianapolis and Dayton on our way to Columbus aren't there anymore. The folks in Knoxville were saying, how come you connect us to Nashville? Well, unfortunately, because of public policy decisions that have been made in the last 20 or 30 or 40 years, the tracks that they were most direct between Nashville and Knoxville in the I-40 cor corridor are gone too. So some of these are gonna be easier than others but all of them are uh, desires and of interest in a lot of these areas. And finally, the president last week, I think a week ago today, announced uh, some of the budget scope for service transportation. Uh, now that that is out in the next few days, 
we'll be uh, putting out our regular uh, legislation and grant request. The Service Transportation Act expired last year and the reauthorization didn't take place, which is not unusual. Congress doesn't always reauthorize the same year that the authorization expires. So the current authorization continues, but our ideas for the reauthorization will be in that same package that we'll be releasing in the next few days. There's a preview of some of that at media.amtrak.com in a letter that our CEO, Bill Flynn, sent to Congress. So those are your Amtrak updates. Thanks, Mark. And I think at this point, uh, we've left a, gotten a few minutes here remaining for, for questions. Hopefully we can fit some in. I'll hand it back to Rick. Excellent, thank you. Um, am I showing up? Am I, are you guys hearing me? We, we hear and see you, Richard. Excellent, that's fantastic. Um, so, um, you know, Jeff, I'm sorry, I, can you go back and talk about the, the future study and how that relates to the Midwest study? And then there's the Chicago terminal study, right? How do those three interact? Yeah, so the, the, the future study is, is more looking at economic trends and, 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 and social policy trends in terms of understanding the, the, the impacts and burdens that communities are, that, that the, especially freight um, has on, on, in, on communities. Um, so in trying to understand where, you know, where are the market trends in freight rail what are the types of commodities that are going to be servicing? What types of facilities will need? And then how does that relate to um, the you know the passenger network and other needs and grade crossings and things like that? So it's I know there are a lot of studies that are that are out there. I think we don't see this one as being duplicative, but complementary to to the other studies that are out there. And we have already um, uh, it interviewed and talked with uh, Amtrak, all of the freight railroads, uh, the FRA. Uh, obviously, IDOT and CDOT and Cook County and the other parties in this, and trying to make sure that that the the, the work that we're doing on the the rail future study is is complementary to and uh, and helps support some of these other studies that are maybe more focused on physical improvements um, um, as opposed to understanding the uh, just the the economic environment that 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 we're we're operating in and the operations kind of related environment we're operating. Does that help? <laughs> yeah, it does help. Absolutely. Um, so I'm sorry to go with the, the last question first, but there's a question in here about getting a more direct trip from Champaign to Union Station without mm -hmm. having to back up. Well, if you look at, uh, I don't know, Jeff, if you want to page back to the big map and uh, show P4 on there, but... Uh, okay. Let me, uh... One of the things that has happened in how Chicago's rail network was developed is that different railroads went different ways to different stations. And of course, the historic Illinois Central main line of Mid-America route was oriented to the lakefront. That's where both the intercity station and the suburban station were located. So we come up that historic route, we hang a left basically under McCormick Place, we go down and almost like we're heading to Aurora, but we stop because we then back the train into Chicago Union Station. Now, for every good reason, all Amtrak trains are at a single station here in Chicago, which is actually what, uh, what Burnham wanted when he started penciling up our station's design in the, in the, in the uh, 1910s or so. So how do you get those trains that are coming up from Champaign, Carbondale and otherwise, over to Union Station. Well, there are two major ideas for that. The first major idea is on this map, that's P4, over there towards Grand Crossing. Grand Crossing's name comes from the Grand Crossing of railroads there. And in fact, there is existing railroad infrastructure that has never been removed, the tracks have, that has trains jump off the right-hand side of the track then come up over the track, and then under those tracks that are next to the uh, next to the Skyway, and then aim us towards that Inglewood flyover. So, if P4 were to be done, that's how that that's that solution to Champaign, and more service on the I-57 corridor. But there is another idea. 
the other idea is once we are is to get onto the basically the rock island and then jump over the south branch of the chicago river and jump into our station now various people have had various opinions about how workable that is and that is being uh, worked on right now to see if that is exactly workable how much footprint it would take from the from the yard facility that's pretty heavily used on the south concourse of the station but those are the two major ways we can save 15 minutes we can save 20 minutes we can maybe even save a half hour by not doing what we're doing now the railroad infrastructure that's down there at p4 is twisty so it's not like we're going to be flying over under and above at great next speed there either so that maybe that's not the fastest solution maybe that's not the bestest solution so we're going to make sure before we get to, to spend money on the create project p4 that it's the right decision and that works underway right now and there may be solutions that involve freight trains going one way and passenger trains going another too there's some lot of permutations that are at least conceivable so yeah there's there's uh, lots of uh, ideas but we need to drive to a solution before we go chasing funding for it and we're trying we're driving to that solution but that's why it is the way it is separately developed railroads with separately separate stations uh and that's the best way to get to champagne of course is on the main line of mid-america owned by cn down there excellent you know i just a, a viewpoint if we can figure out how to reconfigure four runways into six runways at O'Hare under operation, you can probably figure out how to get from the St. Charles Airline down into Union Station. Uh, or St. Charles Airline, for those that don't know, is the uh, east-west railroad that goes underneath McCormick Place to connect to us. You'll see a permanently, a bridge in the permanent up position. That uh, is the bridge that led to the trackage that the former uh, Chicago's Grand Central Station uh, where I used to live at River City was built on that footprint. So there's the infrastructure there. Um, so how does create relate to the need for a south of the lake uh, reroute or bypass? Well, again, I talked about how we'd created, we allowed space. And I see Mike Frankie's actually on the call um, in the participant list. When the Inglewood flyover was designed, it was designed in a way to leave a footprint for a south of the lake passenger only corridor. So, and, a, and that was accounted for in that. Now, will there ever be a south of the lake passenger corridor that basically follows the Skyway, takes and puts one of those two out of service bridges that are uh, down there at the, uh, at the foot of the city, puts them back into service and creates a passenger only route? Uh, some of us have a lot of hope that that will take place to separate passenger trains and freight trains. But that south of the lake idea is designed to feed into that Englewood flyover space that's created. The FRA in the last administration got out of the business of records of decision with here is the grand plan, and they preferred to take things on a project by project basis. We now have a different administration, a different FRA administrator. And I, if, if you can predict to me with your political punditry, Richard, or any of your participants, that uh, how things are going to turn out and what's going to happen next, then give me some lottery numbers for tonight, too, if you'd like. I think it's all going to be unicorns and rainbows. And, <laughs> and we are, we're going to have the, the best trains in the world within the next decade. That's as long as the end of the rainbows here in Chicago, all together. Mm -hmm. Yes. I hope it doesn't take a pot of gold for this to occur. <laughs> no, a couple of pots of gold. Yeah. Um, uh, so Chris Chandler asked what grassroots are doing the best work in promoting uh, the benefits or of uh, high speed and passenger rail services. And of course, I would say the High Speed Rail Alliance is that group. Um, but uh, you're also talking about Louisville and the, the uh, conventional services down there. There's the Rail Passenger Alliance, um, and we I will actually be doing a webinar in the next couple of weeks about who we need to contact with what messages. So look on our events page for that. It's not on a Friday, it's on a Tuesday. Um, 
How are we doing for time? I, I, do, I will not argue with your assessment. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Mark. I appreciate that. <laughs> I'd, I'd also add the Rail Users Network, which is active in some parts of the country. And environmentalists and cycling groups are very, very outspoken. We've, and just this past week in Roanoke, Virginia, we started putting bikes on one of those trains and the cycling community reacted. When these Antrek Midwest rail cars are in service and we'll have more spaces to ca carry bikes safely, that's gonna be transformational in some parts of our network where you don't have to worry about the last mile or two or three or seven or 10 once you get to where you're going. And, and you know, kudos to Howard Lerner and ELPC for the hard work they put into our Chicago Gateway and their continued efforts to uh, increase and improve passenger rail. Yeah, and I think other local organizations like Active Transportation Alliance and the Metropolitan Planning Council, all extremely strong supporters. Obviously they don't devote 100% of their attention to this issue like the High Speed Rail Alliance does, but uh, we, uh, you know, we, uh, it takes, takes everybody. So everybody's pulling their, you know, together and that's good. Excellent. Um, I think that's, we've run out of time. So um, if, if you had a pressing question that I didn't get to, feel free to email me and let me know and we'll get you an answer. Um, uh, we really appreciate uh, all of you for coming to view. And uh, thank you to Jeff and Mark for giving such an excellent presentation. And um, if you enjoyed this uh, uh, presentation, please go to highspeedrail.us and make a donation to support our work. Thank you again, uh, you guys, for coming. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having us. Excellent.